Hey guys from my channel, it's been quite a few days since I've made a video. Maybe more, maybe less, I really have no clue how long from recording this I'll actually release the video. Probably Saturday. I'm recording this on Saturday too, because I'm speedrunning it. This is because I was gonna release a video on Friday morning, but then I lost all the footage. So believe me, with this on top of the trailer, I've been working pretty hard to get you guys some content. The vehicle I lost, or well, the recordings and footage of the vehicle I lost, was a strategic bomber that fit into the prop punk universe I've been developing on my Discord server. While I didn't get to record it, I was still able to post the final results to weekly builds and to my hangar in the Flyout Discord server. If anyone wants to check either of those out, feel free to check the description below. But anyways, speaking of that very specific prop punk timeline we've been working on, while I was recording that video, it like completely exploded on my server. I was in streamer mode so I didn't get to see what was happening or what was going on because I was too busy focusing on the recordings, but like, a lot happened. There were politics, countries, alliances, vehicles, people even creating things for their countries in Sprocket and KSP and Simple Planes. It was pretty nuts. People were even creating fictional aerospace designers with their own servers where they talk about designs, contracts, and economy. Like, what? So instead of shutting it down or trying to change it into my own idea, I want to go along with it. I, for one, think it's super exciting. Small-scale battles, design competitions, and many other future activities on this channel could be planned from this. So, thanks to all those who participated. While just about all the countries have been filled and created, anyone from this video might be able to join for future activities such as conflicts, competitions, and whatever else I may come up with. But let me be the first to tell you guys, this is super cool. I was not expecting so much effort, fun, and just working together to go into this. For those of you on YouTube, I've been able to start piecing together all the world building I've missed. I'll do a video on it a little bit later, but for now I'll describe the extreme basics of what we've come up with, as well as what I've been able to piece together. From 1936 to 1946, the first large-scale conflict involving a large part of the planet happened. Referred to as the Great War, or the Great Intercontinental War, this battle ended with five nuclear bombs being detonated within the border of a country named Cassia, near the capital. After surrendering, Cassia was broken up into multiple buffer states from the surrounding superpowers and was heavily policed in order to maintain peace in the area. Cassia still remains, but only as a husk of its former superpower self. The story of our world begins ten years after this, in 1956. So far, the server has two main alliances. One is reminiscent of Eastern Bloc countries such as China or Russia, and the other is more similar to Western countries such as America and Britain. A country known as the Federal Union of Jinok, which we will be shortening to the FUJN, has contracted an aerospace company known as Contes Aero to do something the world has never seen before. While the sound barrier was broken by rocket vehicles of the time period, the world was yet to pass the sound barrier using air-breathing engines. Since the, in this world twin-spool turbines were never invented, and neither were turbofans, propellers were often used to supplement the lacking low-end power of these primitive turbojets. So long story short, we needed to make a supersonic turboprop under the banner of Contes Aero. Our contractor gave us a list of objectives that we will need to complete for this aircraft which I will list here. Due to increased activity near the FSJN's close allies, we have decided to commission an aircraft capable of more than previous aircraft in our fleet. Necessary parameters. It needs to go supersonic, have a range of at least 1,500 miles, and then some weight and length dimensions that I would try to vaguely follow, though it was made clear that this was not required. So that's a pretty short list of uh, objectives, but that's okay. Due to the time period, there are even more restrictions from the server. To list everything at once so everyone can see how much I actually have to do, here's what it needs to do. The aircraft needs to be capable of supersonic speeds, or at least high subsonic speeds, maybe have it pass the sound barrier in a dive. It needs to have a minimum range of at least 1,500 miles. It needs to be a fairly large aircraft, such as a bomber, escort, or air defense craft. It will be over 20 meters long, or at least around 20 meters long when it's complete. And we have to follow all our turbine rules. You can find those in the server if you're more interested in them, but for those less committed to this, essentially I just have to use very primitive turbines. After consulting our FSJ and contractor, it was also discovered that this thing would be a multi-role aircraft, serving as a light bomber with a bomb bay as well as an escort fighter. 
this was going to be one hell of a tall order, and I wasn't exactly sure how it was going to work at this time. The most complicated part undoubtedly would be making the aircraft supersonic capable, and I'll tell you guys why. The problem with breaking the sound barrier, obviously, is shocks. The shock wave is a boundary of pressure that clings to your aircraft while traveling at supersonic and variably transonic speeds. The pointier your aircraft is, the skinnier the shock will be, and therefore usually the less drag is generated by this shock. You see, the thing about propellers is that they are very not pointy when facing forwards. They are terrible at passing the sound barrier because the shocks will come out horribly detached and wide and the tips will be supersonic and everything will be messed up and you'll lose efficiency basically. Propellers are horrible at passing the sound barrier and they are horrible at transonic speeds. So one of the only ways to actually pass the sound barrier is by simply having a jet with a lot of power behind the propeller to push you past. This was first tried with the XF-84 and then the XF-88 with afterburners, and even then it could still only pass the sound barrier in a dive. To make it worse, with our engine parameters, we had far less power to work with than either of those aircraft. With a basically World War II level turbine, actually passing the sound barrier would be near impossible. I might not even be able to do it in the video. Spoilers, I don't. You'll see at the end, basically if I climbed high I would have probably been able to, but we were only able to reach about Mach 0.97. I ended up not retrying it because the way it ends is very funny. Those who have watched this long, you're going to want to stick around for the test flight. But anyways, it's way too late, we've just spent like almost 7 minutes talking. What on earth am I building? So as you can see, I've sort of made like a heavy air defense fighter style aircraft so far. It's an inverse gull wing with two engine pods on the wings, a pilot, a co-pilot, and eventually we'll also add a tail gunner. You can see the rear landing gear are positioned in little pods by the engines. And also, later on you'll also see that twin counter-rotating props are added to the back of the engine. The idea behind this is it accomplishes the size and range requirements rather easily, so this thing could be an optimal bomber escort or a long-range strike fighter, or strategic whatever nonsense you want it to be. I was also thinking of adding these little rocket pods to the side, but I decide against that. Because once again there were no actual rockets in flyout and I just have to use an air breathing engine and just pretend it's a rocket and that seems kind of stupid, I'd rather just make it supersonic on its own. Even if, you know, that would be basically impossible. I also made it an H-tail and included a very large internal bomb bay. I do a little bit of detail work here on stream, but obviously not the whole thing, because I want to save that for the montage. But you'll also notice as I'm making the interior here that you have a little radar in the nose. Because of this, while doing the interior, I decided to make a little radar screen. The interior and all of its building components is far and away one of the more tedious parts of this, and that's why I don't usually include them in the build compilations, because it just takes so much time and actually gives you so little on the actual aircraft. Almost all of the actual detail work I do is off camera, because it takes a very long time and adds very little to the aircraft, except for that little pop you need at the end. Which is why it's sort of perfect for not showing it on video, but showing it in the montage so I don't take too too much time. But once again, I wasn't recording for a little bit while building this thing, so I actually ended up losing a little bit of build footage, so you guys get to see a little bit of interior building. Basically, I just use a little sub-assembly, little, uh, the screen that I have there, uh, add a little bit to it, add a radar screen, add a six-pack, add some gauges for the engines, add the landing gear and landing gear lights, and add a little radio. That basically sums up the entire interior of this thing. I usually don't do incredibly advanced interiors on these aircraft since, you know, I do have time constraints at the end of the day. Maybe for my super detailed uh, aircraft build series, if I ever end up doing that, I'll make a more detailed cockpit, but for now, they're staying relatively simple. Also, one thing to note is that the guy behind the pilot is in fact a co-pilot, he's not like a Wizzo or a Rio or something. So he ends up also getting a little control panel here. I end up actually using the same one for him. The idea behind that is on longer flights, the uh, guy up front can take a nice nap or, you know, take a rest while the guy in the back can fly and vice versa. Then also I have a tail gunner just because this is a very large and heavy aircraft and I feel like more maneuverable planes may have an easier time getting on its tail. So after finishing up the interior, the bomb bay, some details, some basic controls of the aircraft, and of course giving it some thorough tests in flight performance and engine performance, 
That was just about it. We were ready to fly. And the plane was complete. I was actually really, really, really happy with the way it looked. Of course, we had to use FSJ and roundels and such, which had already, luckily, been invented by the server for the aircraft to represent the Air Force it was flying for, but it was a really nice airplane. Some of you might have noticed from the montage that this thing actually has AIM-9s on it, which the AIM-9 is an IR-seeking missile, for those who don't know. Basically, the reason for this is, at this time period, I'm assuming very primitive IR missiles are of existence. Flares also most likely would have existed at this time, or at least been in testing development, depending on the country and the manufacturer and all that stuff. So, you know, since everything was still mostly subsonic, it was sort of at this really weird time where there were missiles and tail gunners on the same aircraft. And you know what? I absolutely loved it. The aerospace manufacturer I'm working for, which I believe is Contes in this video, typically has different styles of aircraft, but I had assumed that since this was an early build that it still could be something completely feasible for the designer. You can check out any of their design concepts on my server, of course. But anyways, the goals for this flight were pretty simple. We needed to climb to a fairly high altitude, let's say 25,000 feet, gain a little bit of speed, and then go supersonic. At least that's what we were going to try to do. The thing about this flight is that I actually didn't gain that much speed at the end there, and I certainly didn't actually go high enough, which was a massive problem. This thing could hit about 520 miles an hour on the deck, like at sea level, and I utilized absolutely none of that speed for this. Here you can see I'm scared, I realize I can't actually pull up in time, and I slam into the ground. <laughs> But you know what, we're still going. This is a complete disaster. The plane's in multiple pieces. I keep hitting the ground, but we are still going. We're gonna crash land this thing. And that's exactly what ends up happening. I crash the airplane after diving too far at too high of a speed, and I end up skittering to a stop, only achieving Mach 0.97 in this flight. I guess that makes the flight a failure, but I still wanted to show you guys because I had a fairly entertaining ending to it. But you know what? Somehow, the main pilot Jimmy and the tail gunner Jimmy actually survived this. So, you know, that's a win at least. Uh, what do we even tell the FSJN after this? Oh, we just ruined your experimental airplane by accidentally crashing it into the ground trying to break the sound barrier. No, we have to spice it up somehow. We'll say, um, we encountered an unexpected litho-breaking maneuver after miscalculating the velocity and angle of the aircraft's approach. Yes, we'll just tell them that, it'll totally be fine, yes, of course. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you all in the next one. Try not to perform any unexpected litho-breaking maneuvers as I did, and have a great rest of the day. Goodbye.